In this episode, we got to see optimism and cynicism clash. Or maybe it's just optimism and realism. Because, let's be real, reality tends to suck. And that seems to be a favorite theme of Attack on Titan. Hello listeners, and welcome to A Dash of Salt with AJ. I'm your host, Ahsoka Jackson, author, podcaster, poet, and freelance proofreader. So, for this episode of the podcast, I want to go ahead and talk about that great scene with EMA at the firing range, where they're considering Paradis' prospects for the future. Armin and Mikasa are both trying to look on the sunny side of things here. They've seen progress made in a positive direction, and this has given them all sorts of hope. They're like, hey, there's water in the glass! Aaron has seen this as well, and it's not that he's denying it, but what he's focused on and points out is the other side of it. He's like, sure. There's water in the glass. But the glass is almost empty, and we're about to freaking die of thirst. So excuse me for not being bursting with hope and good cheer over what little water we do have. This is why I didn't even use the term uh, glass half full a second ago. That would be more than Team Paradise actually has right now. And I noticed how Armin wanted to call the whole thing a misunderstanding, and Aaron sort of stopped him right there. See, this is... This is kind of a great thing about Aaron in this season, although we already saw hints of it in the prior seasons. But in this one especially, he's like this voice of super blunt pragmatism. That's also what makes him so frustrating and vexing to try and challenge and argue with, because he tends to make a lot of good points. And the stuff he points out hurts, because he goes for the brutal, hard to hear truth and reality, but you, can't de- but you can't deny how valid and accurate what he's saying is. Even if you disagree with his ultimate conclusions or the decisions he makes, when it comes to acting upon that information, you have to admit that the points he made in coming to that conclusion were pretty freaking solid. Which is unfortunate because he tends to be the bearer of bad news right now, to put it quite mildly. Surprisingly enough, in his comments here, he actually lends some credence to the enemy side in all of this. Even if most of what they think is wrong, they're not actually wrong about the core idea that the Eldians do possess special abilities and that they do have the potential to wield a great deal of power and cause a good amount of destruction. And that fact immediately makes the Paradisians' jobs more difficult. Because instead of just being able to say that the fears are without basis and that the scenarios folks are scared of aren't possible, they instead have to convince people to have faith in their good intentions and level heads, and say that they don't actually plan to abuse their powers. It's sort of like the whole rumbling thing. We do know for sure at this point that the walls contain massive titans. Based on what we've seen, they're a bit smaller than the full-blown colossal form wielded by Bertolt and now Armin, but they're still huge. And it does seem like they're capable of being awoken under the right circumstances, like exposure to sunlight. And the folks in Paradis, Aaron included, do seem to believe that the whole rumbling scenario can indeed happen, and just and isn't just a myth or empty threat. With that in mind, the rest of the world actually does have some legitimate concerns. And if it turns out that the history we've heard uh, of regarding old LD is also true, then that would give further basis for worrying that the present-day Eldians might again abuse the powers of the Titans. Now, if you've listened to my past episodes, you already know what I think of Willie Tiber. I am ticked off with his BS and with how the other nations were actually agreeing with his reprehensible scapegoating bull. Even without knowing about the memory wipe, the reality is that the current Eldians from Paradis have been living in peace when it comes to the other nations, and Marley has been the one terrorizing them and its own Eldian citizens, plus trying to conquer the rest of the globe. I believe that saying that they should just start fresh from a clean slate is oversimplifying things at this point. There's heavy baggage that needs to be addressed on Marley's side, and probably from the Eldians' side as well. I partly want to address this now, and I know some of my followers are interested in this conversation, and it's definitely a really important one to consider in the storyline. But at this point, I'm sort of waiting to hopefully get more details and confirmation in the narrative. Like if Eren has visions of the past again, as when he accessed Grisha and Kruger's memories, or what I said in my trailer reactions about how maybe he can commune with past shifters the way Season 3 hinted at when it came to Armin and Bertolt. But I can address this a little bit here, in theoretical terms. If old Eldia is guilty of what's been accused of, a lengthy campaign of murder, rape, ethnic cleansing, etc., then there's no way in heck that just magically disappears from the books. Unless maybe, maybe we're talking about a faction that hasn't been involved in those practices in the first place. But I don't really get the impression that this was the case. It sounds like the kingdom as a whole was doing this, and the different factions were just fighting over control. 
In other words, if the history is accurate, then it sounds like the people King Fritz gathered up were no more or less guilty at that point than any other group of citizens. However, with the timeline of nearly a century having passed, the ones currently inhabiting Paradis would generally be the descendants of that splinter group, and the splinter group itself was mind-wiped. So what we're currently dealing with are descendants of the actual perps, and these descendants themselves have been at peace for the re with the rest of the world for the past 80 years or so. Heck, they didn't know the rest of the world's humanity even existed. It'd be one thing if they were carrying on the practices of their predecessors, or if they were terrorizing slash mistreating the other nations and ethnicities in new ways instead. But they're doing neither. Now, they still have their own things to address internally, but that's not what we're addressing right now. With things as they were at that point, during that conversation from three years ago, I certainly don't consider it just to talk about killing off the current Eldian generations as punishment for the sins those individuals have neither committed nor embraced. And you already know how I feel about the fudged up preventive plan bull from Tiber. Fudge that all the way. And I'm looking at things from a scriptural perspective as well, where in general the principles are that self-defense is both allowed and encouraged, but being the aggressor is forbidden. And if the opponents decide to stop the war and pursue peace, you're required to make a good faith effort yourself, even if you have some suspicious reservations about the other side. I do recall there are certain caveats to that, but I don't believe those are applicable here, so I won't worry about them right now. Now, some people have even said that you could technically argue that the war itself never even ended. It's just been going on one-sidedly with the continued marling and attacks. But either way, I'd say, under the current circumstances, Marley does not have any business continuing its attacks on parties, let alone escalating them, and they must respect the current parties' Eldian's demonstrated peaceful words and actions. The bloodshed and aggression must stop, and the concerns regarding Eldia's history are essential to address, but that's over the longer term. In the present and the immediate future, peaceful relationships should be established unless and until one side does something significant to breach the peace. Now, that was back then, three years ago, and at this point things are obviously more difficult. But even Aaron's attack on Liberia was in general a justified act of self-defense. So what's needed at this point would be for Marley to stop its ongoing attacks, and parties to refrain from further ones. And both sides, plus the other nations of the world, work on developing at least a ceasefire and then firmer, longer-term measures for peace. Alright guys, thanks for listening to me today, and I hope you've had a great time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe and turn your notifications on so you can get updates. You can help make the podcast more visible for new viewers and listeners by leaving a like, share, comment, or review on whichever platform you use to listen. YouTube, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, social media, etc. And as of recently, the podcast is on a newer site as well, Verbal. I'll have an extra link for that. Be blessed and stay salty. One major thing I would like to point out here. In order to actually have possible reparations over time for Eldia's prior actions, it makes more sense to allow them to develop the island and establish trade relationships with the other nations so that they can build wealth. I'll probably get into that more somewhere down the line. But like I said previously, if the accounts of the Eldian Empire's nearly 2,000 year reign of horror are accurate, I'm sure as heck not intending to shrug it off. But like I said, that's for the longer term work. Right now, the people you're dealing with on parties warrant having their wishes for peace respected and treated in good faith. Hello listeners, and welcome to A Dash of Salt with AJ. I'm your host, Ahsoka Jackson, author, podcaster, poet, and freelance proofreader. Last time I left off sharing my views about what would be the reasonable approach to take in regards to establishing peace between Eldia and the other nations in the shorter term, which would then be used as a gateway to longer term peace. By Eldia, I mean Paradise Island, basically. Of course, all of this would require not eliminating the grudges, but being willing to put them aside for the moment, in order to focus on the more important goal here 
of preventing further bloodshed and needless loss of life and destruction of property. And not just put aside the grudges, but also swallow down some legitimate fears that they do have about the Eldians' powers and the possibility that they may misuse those again. And yes, the stakes for that are high. But that doesn't mean the other nations get to default to the ongoing aggression and preemptive military strikes they plan to do. This goes back to something I pointed out in the Declaration of War episode, though. They're not even viewing and treating the Eldians of Paradis as human beings, even. They're not even bothering to try to speak to them as a sovereign nation, or even just a splinter group of refugees. Heck, I think some people in the fandom sort of regard the island or population as being a Marleyan colony of sorts, but they're not even being treated like that either. Like I said before, that idea of being trapped there as livestock, we're finding out that it's actually more true than we even realized, but we've now witnessed that it's not the mindless titans that are the biggest threats, it's the Marleans. And it makes me so freaking mad. You could probably hear in my voice some in the coverage for the Declaration of War, and I had to wipe my eyes a few times here too as I was writing the script for this podcast episode. The way the people of Paradis are being treated, like their lives can just be thrown away. And I remember I actually saw someone, and he actually seemed dead serious and not just like a troll. This one guy arguing that the Eldians actually shouldn't really be counted as proper humans due to their powers, and that with the threat they pose, the whole race war type thing is justified. Someone had a really good reply though. They said something to the effect of, Thank you for so perfectly demonstrating what I just said about how some people completely miss the points of Attack on Titan and just do not get the series. Oh my freaking goodness. This reminds me of that whole thing in the X-Men about humans versus mutants. I've always disliked that terminology and I'm like, both of y'all can get over yourselves because both groups are human. You can say normal versus mutants or unmutated versus mutated, okay. But not one group that's just called human, as though the other group isn't. Now you could definitely argue that maybe the Eldian powers are on a different scale here, with the extent of the transformation and the way the ability is passed down. But even so, both versions of the history, the more positive and the more negative, start with the first time, Ymir, as having been a normal human girl who was given the powers somehow. So she's not an alien, and she's not some other species. She was a human from Earth who gained powers and was able to pass down the changes to her descendants. Sure, it's a significant difference, and I'm not denying that. My point is that it's just that it's just completely absurd to suddenly jump to not counting them as humans. And then, of course, using that as a loophole to treat them any freaking way you want, and so you have the right to. But that's the exact kind of absolute bull that's already going on in the storyline right now. It's just freaking insane. Humans are awful, what can I say? Now, I already acknowledged this whole issue earlier and what Aaron pointed out about it. The Eldians do indeed have special abilities that sort of set them aside as a category and do mean that they have powers that can pose a particular threat to other populations. And I don't think you're doing any favors by trying to pretend that this doesn't exist or matter, especially since you need to be honest about and address this if you actually want to be able to talk things out with the other countries. In fact, one thing I can say is that, when you think about it, the people of Paradis have now spent nearly a century dealing with oppression themselves and the horror and terror of dealing with the Titans. So hopefully that will aid them in having proper empathy and respect when it comes time to address the other nation's parts in all of this. Actually, that brings me to a quick point someone made uh, regarding what Udo from the Warrior Program commented about earlier in the season. The nations that Marley has been conquering and fighting against have had to face the Titans in battle themselves. And so even though those Titans are working on behalf of Marley, and also being outright victimized by them as well, especially those forcibly transformed into mindless Titans, the problem is that the people from other countries are still going to mainly associate all of this with just the Eldians, specifically. So it's not just the past crimes against humanity we've heard about with regards to the Eldian Empire. Those haven't yet really been confirmed yet in the anime, and I'm waiting on that myself. But what we have seen as an absolute fact is the ongoing and recent trauma other nations are experiencing from Marley's misuse of the Titan powers. So when you ask other nations to sit down and talk with folks on parties, you're also asking them to swallow down those very fresh and raw feelings 
a very legitimate pain and fear temporarily for the sake of peace. I know Udo was kind of hyper, but I liked him. He was really sharp and observant, and I feel like the story specifically took time to show that so he could appreciate his potential and what he could have contributed to the team had he lived, much like Marco. And returning to the EMA conversation, we get another crucial moment regarding Aaron's perspective, where what he believes is that in order for the Eldians of Paradis to have enough time to actually sit down and negotiate with the rest of the world, they'll first have to disable people's attack capabilities. Because these other folks are already operating largely on a basis of shooting first and asking questions never, really. Uh, and someone made a really key observation here. Aaron didn't actually deny outright that there was a chance for peace and that sitting down and talking might actually work. But what he was saying was that to have any chance for that, they'd first need sufficient time, and he believed that they wouldn't have that amount of time if they didn't take any military measures themselves. And this is where the timeline really comes into play, which is something I referenced earlier. There are two hugely significant things that were shown here. First of all, Aaron waited. He gave time for his comrades to work on things to find a solution. I would say, for the most part, he genuinely wanted a peaceful solution. Most part. I don't think the vengeful side of him is completely gone. The hurting, grieving child who saw his mother die a horrific death and who wants a price exacted for that. I don't think it would be accurate to say that this is gone from him completely. But I do think he's reached a point where revenge is no longer a primary motive for him, and he'd willingly give it up if he felt there was a true path to lasting peace for parties. I believe that this is now his highest priority, and what he's willing to sacrifice other interests or motives for. Now, here's where the timeline kicks in. The EMA scene took place three years before present day in our storyline, and what he says then is that Zeke only has three years to live which means that he actually held off on attacking until the clock was really running out and they were going to lose an essential piece due to the time limit with Zeke and the Curse of Ymir. But he gave his comrades the freedom to work and find an alternative in the meantime, and that ultimately didn't happen. What's more, he gave that same chance to the world itself and to Marley. And what happened? Marley won the war with the Mideast Allied forces, but only by a hair. And then they turned their sights once more on Paradis Island so that they could retake the full power of the Titans, plus still Paradis' reserves of natural resources. Which I think is a plot point that tends to get overlooked a fair bit. Marley wanted these resources to help them develop and basically stay on top of the global arms race. Alright guys, thanks for listening to today, and I hope you've had a great time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe and turn your notifications on to get updates. You can help make the podcast more visible for new viewers and listeners by leaving a like, share, comment, or review on whichever platform you use to listen. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, social media, etc. Now, be blessed and stay salty. Hello listeners, and welcome to Dash of Salt with AJ. I'm your host, Ahsoka Jackson, author, podcaster, poet, and freelance proofreader. I left off last time talking about how Marley wanted to not only take control of the Titans, but also take the natural resources of Paradis Island in order to help stay ahead in the global arms race. And mentioning that global arms race brings me to another key point, which Army mentioned a little bit in talking about the port. Marley has both the will and the capabilities to launch a devastating assault upon Paradis rapidly. In fact, Aaron already noted during that conversation from three freaking years ago that the only reason they were succeeding in fending off the incursions from the ships was that Marley wasn't using its full power, and this wasn't actually a serious full-force invasion. Aaron really is sharper than folks realized. Sharp, observant, and rather a realist. And it actually shows how much he had already developed at that point, just one year removed from the fight to reclaim Shikanshina. The fiery kid who's normally just charging ahead with the determination and looks at obstacles and goes, yeah, but we're gonna win anyways and beat the odds. Now he's like, yeah, these guys would definitely annihilate us if they actually launched a full-blown attack. He seems to have a clearer and stronger grasp of the situation than his comrades and even superiors do. 
I'm sure it's helped that he's experienced Marys from both Grisha and Kruger, and saw some of how powerful Marley already was all those decades ago. That actually brings me to another thing I'd missed. The fact that the figures Yelena gave for the Marley military size basically mean that just the military approximately equals or exceeds the entire population size of parties, based on the estimates we have. It was another viewer who pointed um, that out, like the uh, size or scale comparison. Now, I know some people have tried to do more complex calculations about population density, but we actually have some very straightforward info already, assuming the figures referenced are in relation to the entire population within the walls. Here's how it goes. The first breach on the walls occurred in 845, when Aaron was 10. The second episode of the show states that in the following year, 846, about 250,000 people were sent out in a supposed reclamation project to retake Wall Maria. Of course, it's clarified later that this was a sham and the population was really just being culled. And I think someone also mentioned that it's revealed later on that this wasn't even necessary because if the wealthy or nobility had been willing to repurpose their own large holdings of land, they would have been able to provide enough food to keep the population from freaking starving to death. But nah, why use empathy when you can just use murder? Can't let some starving people get in the way of your freaking polo games or whatever the fudge you're doing on your grassy greens. Just have the government sentence them to death by Tain. You might recall that this was the fate of Armin's grandfather, who'd been caring for him after the government had murdered both of Armin's parents. These are their own people. Yet Armin wants to be all optimistic about Marley and the rest of the world, who already have that nice thick layer of outright hatred for the people of parties. Is Armin's hopefulness inspiring or just naive? Our increasingly cynical Aaron didn't just dismiss it out of hand though, so I'll cut Armin some slack. If you pay attention, one key thing in Attack on Titan is that the commonality and kinship that's actually shown between parties and the world beyond apply in both positive and negative ways. We've spent three seasons seeing in intimate detail the flaws and outright vices and ugliness present in both individual characters and larger groups. The Uprising arc showed us both the deep-rooted corruption and callousness of the government and some really dark, brutal edges to our own beloved characters. And Aaron has witnessed and experienced all of this himself, the darker sides to the government, his friends and comrades, and himself. There's a quote from Blaise Pascal that goes like this. What a chimera then is man. What a novelty. What a monster. What a chaos. What a contradiction. What a prodigy. Judge of all things, feeble earthworm. Repository of truth, sewer of uncertainty, and error. The glory and scum of the universe. What Aaron expressed to Reiner about seeing both the good and the bad, the wonderful and the ugly, all of that also applies to parodies. And really the whole point is about recognizing that, in many ways, both populations are normal people. And the humanity sucks thing I said earlier applies to both. Now, Marley is in the wrong in this specific conflict. And there's also this warped racial stuff that seems to be the one big spot where parodies stands out as being less sucky than most of humanity. This is actually nicely pulled off in the series, where, from what we can tell, Paradis has this very mixed yet homogenous population, where the issues regarding that seem to be pretty limited, though not non-existent. It was actually pulled off in a way that felt natural and convincing, rather than Pollyannish and saccharine. But those dark sides and flaws we see are actually another layer of challenge in considering negotiations with other nations and trying to tamp down their fear. The people in Paradis are not the monsters the rest of the world has made them out to be, but they definitely are the regular human levels of fudged up and exasperating, and there already have been people in power there who have misused their power and authority. They straight up mass cold their own folks. This is part of why I keep emphasizing that as much as I'm here for Team Paradis and I'm sick of Marley's fudged up shenanigans and outright lies, it's not just reasonable or helpful to just completely lose it and start pretending that our folks on parties are a group of saints who can do no wrong and whom the rest of the world shouldn't bat an eyelash about. Frankly, both sides need to, in various ways, get their shiznit together and stop acting like jack-offs. Man, I've really gotten off track here, but I'm glad I've said all this. 
But the point with the calculations is that the group of 250,000 was stated to be approximately 20% of the population. If that's the case, and this refers to the entire population, not just what had been within Wall Maria, then that means the original population was about 1.25 million. And I think if they'd only meant the Wall Maria or refugee population with that percentage, that would have been specified. So I think that's the entire population within the walls as a whole. Now, nearly the entire 250,000 were wiped out, so that brings it down to about an even million souls left on parties, not counting the Titans. Now, this has been nearly 10 years ago, so I'm sure they've replaced some of the cold population by now, but probably not by a ton, so I figure it's still probably not that far over a million right now. And that's about the size of Marley's military, before even counting the ships, and certainly before counting all those other nations that were cheering Willy on and about to provide their own assistance for the genocide. And I just realized something else. Another thing explained in the series was that those special lore towns or districts like Shiganshina existed because the walls were too extensive to really have thorough coverage from the military. So instead, they basically funneled the Titans to specific areas of the wall and focused on defending those. And one of the information slides on the show indicates that the military police forces number about 2,000. And then if you count the garrison regiment, which is under their command, that number rises to a whopping 5,000. I don't know what the survey uh, regiment numbers were, but from what I recall, the garrison regiment was said to be where the bulk of the military recruits ended up. Plus, scouts had really high casualty rates, and they were eventually almost annihilated entirely by Zeke. Although one thing hinted at in Season 4 thus far, like with Commander Lobov, is that the garrison and scout regiments may have been merged now that the garrison no longer has to guard the walls from the mindless titans. Just to clarify, in present day, it's been four years since Zeke and Reiner's defeat and Bertolt's death. And after that battle ended, the team spent another year cleaning out the remaining mindless titans. The beach scene at the very end of Season 3 happened after that one year period had passed. So it's now been four years since the big battle, but only three years since they finished clearing out the Titans and Aaron was able to set aside Sun Marley as the next step in things. But even if the military had been growing and recovering from some of the losses, there still aren't nearly enough to take on Marley. Even if the forces had freaking quintupled, which I think is rather unlikely, that'd still only be about 25,000 troops compared to Marley's million. And I'm pretty sure those numbers don't even take into account the Eldian Marlians who are forcibly turned into Titans and used as living weapons on the battlefield. Though if Aaron could finally use the Founding Titans' powers, at least those wouldn't be an issue anymore, plus he can control the Warrior Titans as well. Of course, that just goes back to reasons to work with Zeke rather than purely pursuing the diplomatic routes. But my larger point here is that I understand why Aaron felt that an early strike was their only option. If they just waited on the island until after Marley had properly assembled its own forces, let alone those from other nations as well, I don't see Paradis having any chance of survival. Alright guys, thanks for listening to today and I hope you've had a great time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe and turn your notifications on so you can get updates. You can help make the podcast more visible for new viewers and listeners by leaving a like, share, comment, or review on whichever platform you used to listen. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, social media, etc. Now, be blessed and stay salty.